Okay, Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about a very important uh, guidelines that was released uh, on the 2nd of August, just three weeks ago. It's International Guidelines for Management of Sepsis and Septic Shock uh, uh, this year. Okay. So this one supersedes the previous guideline that was released in 2016. Uh, so the definitions uh, still remain the same. Sepsis or is uh, defined as a life-threatening host organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. Then uh, septic shock is a uh, sepsis despite uh, volume resuscitation uh, and uh, requiring uh, vasopressors to maintain MEP of 65 or serum lactate is persistently more than 2 despite uh, resuscitation. And, so, uh, diagnosis of sepsis and septic shock uh, confers different mortality risks, which is why we need to diagnose them early and uh, uh, resuscitate adequately so that we can get the right uh, diagnosis and um, monitor patients uh, appropriately. So, uh, these are the uh, uh, most important components of uh, management of uh, sepsis once it's uh, identified. So, this, this is the sepsis 6. This was from the uh, 2016 guidelines. So we take three and we give three upon diagnosis of uh, sepsis. So we take, uh, we take lactate, cultures, and uh, monitor urine output. And we give oxygen, crystalloids, and antibiotics uh, and reassess patients uh, after one hour. or uh, and, and also after the three hour of uh, fluid uh, resuscitation. So uh, the, the differences in the current guidelines uh, would uh, involve uh, the type and uh, amount of uh, fluid uh, for resuscitation as uh, recommended uh, the, and also a um, few other minor components that I will highlight shortly. So this is the guideline that was that I'll be talking about today. Uh, it's it's uh, published in Springerling and I've uploaded it to the uh, Encore Passover group. So the uh, 2021 uh, guidelines uh, consists of uh, a few domains, okay? uh, eight domains, and I will be talking about, I will be touching on all and uh, focusing on the ones in uh, pink. So to start off, um, from the first uh, guidelines, uh, sorry, from 2016 guidelines, uh, Q so far was introduced, uh, which is a, a three variable uh, a screening tool at the bedside, okay? But uh, unfortunately, okay, the, the use of Q so far is uh, to allow clinicians to diagnose uh, sepsis uh, fast so that we can start uh, resuscitation early. However, uh, after five years of uh, study and also clinical ex experiences, uh, it was found that Q so far is not an ideal screening tool for sepsis. Uh, it is not a good uh, uh, standalone screening tool for sepsis. Okay, because uh, only 24% of uh, patients with infection had Q so far of 2 or 3. Uh, Whereas uh, the majority was uh, who had sepsis did not have Q so far 2 or 3. And uh, of the 24% of uh, patients with Q so far 2 or 3, 70% uh, of them uh, had uh, poor outcomes, which means that, uh, which infers that uh, Q so far might have uh, missed a lot of patients or it would have um, picked up uh, patients who are really ill only. So um, the gui guidelines suggested that IQ so far should not be used as a single screening tool. Instead, um, the guidelines recommended for use of um, uh, you know to use a few, a few uh, modalities such as a patient's clinical status, vital signs, heart rate, and also uh, six screening tools such as Q so far, SIRS, or NEWS as a tool to diagnose uh, sepsis. Now, um, over the top there, the first uh, guide, guide, the first recommendation was um, for the use of performance improvement program for sepsis, including uh, sepsis screening uh, for acutely ill, high-risk patients and standard operating procedures for treatment. Now, a uh, sepsis improvement program consists of sepsis screening, education, uh, measurement of sepsis bundle performance, and also outcomes, along with the actions uh, that are suggested for uh, whatever adverse outcomes that uh, will be seen. And uh, according to uh, meta-analysis of 50 studies, uh, the um, 
the use of a sepsis improvement program is associated with better adherence to sepsis care bundles along with a reduction in mortality. Uh, the uh, OR is 0.66, that means it's uh, more towards protective, which means it reduces mortality. Then, um, and also there is, a, from the 2016 statement, compared to the 2016 statement, the uh, use of standard operating procedures was also um, uh, suggested by uh, the guidelines this year. Okay, so next is uh, initial resuscitation. Okay, so this is an important slide. Um, so, um, the guidelines recommended uh, treatment and resuscitation immediately after diagnosis of sepsis. And um, the controversy is in uh, uh, the, the, the 30 mils per kg of uh, crystalloid. Okay. Uh, in 2016, the guidelines recommended that uh, we use uh, 30 mils per kg of uh, IV crystalloid in the first three hours. But um, it was downgraded to just a suggestion due to a uh, uh, lower, lower grade of evidence because there is no prospective interventional studies that compare the different volumes for initial resuscitation. However, uh, there were a few um, uh, RS, uh, trials that were conducted and uh, in these trials, uh, the fluid amount used was 30 mils per kilo, which means that um, it, it doesn't prove that uh, the 30 mils per kilo uh, works or doesn't work, but what it proves is that it has been incorporated into clinical practice. Okay, so next is um, the uh, okay, the okay. so we're giving, giving fluids. How are we going to measure the uh, ad uh, adequacy of uh, fluid resuscitation? So this year, the guidelines recommended the use of dynamic measures to guide fluid resuscitation over physical examination of static parameters. Uh, the evidence given was that there's uh, the meta-analysis demonstrated um, dynamic assessment uh, to guide fluid therapy is associated with reduced mortality, reduced ice to length of stay, and reduced ratio of mechanical ventilation. Uh, so uh, these are clinically pro proven and uh, sorry, uh, statistically proven. And uh, the other measures that were recommended by the 2021 guidelines to is uh, uh, reducing lactate levels and uh, use of capillary refill time to guide resuscitation at the very least. However, the guidelines did not uh, specify the target lactate le levels. Now, what is, uh, okay, there are two ways to measure fluid resuscitation, dynamic and adynamic measures. So dynamic measures, um, Usually seen in uh, ICU uh, things where there is um, uh, there is uh, uh, there are few measures here: passive flick uh, raising with uh, cardiac output monitoring measure uh, output mon measurement via um, the monitoring system, uh, invasive monitoring system such as the flow track cardiac output monitor, stroke volume and also stroke volume variation, also using the uh, cardiac output monitoring system. So, uh, in, in okay, the benefits of our dynamic measures is that we have a better real-time uh, and accurate measure to predict fluid responsiveness in patients who are being resuscitated. Uh, in comparison, a dynamic measures are uh, the ones that are clinically used at uh, low-income settings such as uh, uh, measurement of pulse rate, and then urine output, uh, CVP monitoring, and uh, SBP. These are uh, practical measures, but they are poor indicators of fluid status compared to um, the dynamic measures. So what the uh, flow track does is, it measures cardiac output in real time using pulse wave contour analysis of arterial waveform from a pulmonary artery catheter that was inserted. Uh, so it is an invasive mode of monitoring, but it's more accurate. And uh, another limitation is that it is expensive. Next is uh, the, the guidelines mentioned uh, target MAP, which uh, was kept at 65, no changes there. Uh, and the guidelines are suggested uh, admission to IC within six hours for close monitoring. No changes from the previous guideline. Okay, so this is uh, another important domain of the guideline, uh, which talks about uh, infection. 
So, in patients with uh, okay, so this is a best practice uh, best practice uh, statement. So, patients with um, suspected sepsis or shock but has a uh, unconfirmed infection, patients should be continuously re-evaluated uh, and searched for alternative diagnosis, uh, especially non-infective causes. And uh, the empiric uh, antimicrobial should be discontinued uh, at the earliest uh, possible moment. Okay. And um, so, why? Uh, okay, so next is uh, why do we need to continuously reevaluate for possibility of non infective causes? First, because uh, signs and symptoms of sepsis are non specific and it often mimics other, uh, other diseases. Secondly, there is no gold standard test to diagnose sepsis. And thirdly, one third of patients diagnosed with sepsis turn out to have non infectious conditions. So, therefore, uh, clinicians need to continuously reassess patients and decide if uh, patients are in sepsis or not, and then discontinue the anti empiric uh, antibiotics accordingly. Uh, the re okay, then the remaining uh, statement will be discussed in the next slide. It's a change to uh, antibiotic timing. So the timing of antibiotics now uh, is has been stratified based on two things, which are the likelihood of sepsis on assessment and the presence of shock. So if you see in the small box there, the 2000 statement, 2016 statement states that the anti, uh, IV antimicrobial should be initiated as soon as uh, possible after shock is uh, shock sorry, sepsis, with or without shock has been recognised. Okay, So, the current guideline, um, uh, okay, the current guideline suggests uh, this. If sepsis is definite or probable, uh, regardless of shock, uh, patients should be uh, commenced on antimicrobials immediately. Okay, But if uh, the uh, evidence for sepsis upon clinical assessment is uh, not that convincing, uh, but patient is in shock, then we need to start antibiotics immediately within one hour. However, if patient is, is sus only suspected to be in sepsis and there are other differentials to uh, why the patient pre uh, pre presents with uh, symptoms that they're presenting with, and there's no shock, uh, patient should be rapidly assessed upon, uh, uh, upon arrival for uh, infectious wood and uh, non-infectious causes of acute illness and then uh, we give them three hours if at the end of three hours patient uh, we, we cannot uh, we cannot objectively exclude an infection as the cause of sepsis of the uh, sorry uh, uh, as the cause of the uh, uh, patient's illness then we need to cover the patient with uh, uh, empiric antimicrobials <laughs> so in other words uh, we need to be a bit cautious about uh, when and uh, in which condition of patient presentation that we start antibiotics for. Next, uh, it's about the uh, patients with um, whom we are suspecting to have um, MRSA. So about MRSA, the current guidelines upgraded one recommendation to best practice and it downgraded one recommendation to a mere suggestion. So the new best practice is in using empiric antibiotics with MRSA coverage patients with sepsis or septic shock with high risk of MRSA, while the suggestion is uh, in not using empiric antibiotics with uh, MRSA coverage in patients with low risk of MRSA uh, infection. Okay. So we need to, uh, when we're thinking of, uh, when we're suspecting MRSA infection, we need to know of the risk factors that patient might have for uh, MRSA, uh, which are in the box here whether patients has, have had any previous MRSA infection, recent IV antibiotics, uh, history of recurrent infection or chronic wound, any invasive devices uh, uh, in, in place, uh, patient has had any HD therapy before, recent hospitalization or severity of illness. Okay. Now, uh, observational studies are quite inconsistent. Uh, in uh, Sorry, the outcomes of the observational studies are inconsistent. In MRSA patients, uh, there is, okay, sorry, it, Delays in commencing antibiotics with uh, MRSA coverage in MRSA patients were associated, associated with increased mortality in some studies, but not other studies. Okay? And in patients with no uh, MRSA, uh, starting broad-spectrum antibiotics with uh, 
uh, agents that are active against MRSA was associated with one mortality. So next, we need to think about how to decide whether to uh, start antibiotics with MRSA coverage. So we need to think of three things before we decide. So first is the likelihood of MRSA as the cause of infection. Secondly, the risk of harm with withholding the treatment for MRSA in a patient who might actually have MRSA. And thirdly, the risk of harm associated with giving the treatment in a patient that doesn't have the MRSA. So if the, uh, the clinician has to think of all this and uh, if the patient is uh, alert and uh, is, has capacity, uh, they may involve the patient or family members in their decision. Next, uh, about use of antifungals and beta lactams. <coughs> the guidelines committee has downgraded the recommendation to suggestions for the use of uh, empiric antifungal therapy in patients with sepsis and uh, of those with uh, at high risk of a fungal infection. The guidelines also should suggested against using antifungal therapy in patients at low risk of fungal infection. The, there are two meta-analyses that report reduced in a reduction in short-term mortality in prolonged intrusion of beta lactams. Okay, so um, the, the new the, the new guidelines also uh, concurs with the practice of um, giving prolonged infusion of uh, anti uh, beta lactams instead of giving boluses. Okay? So what is a prolonged infusion of beta lactams? It is uh, basically uh, infusion of uh, beta lactam antibiotics over three hours or so, uh, with um, especially in uh, cases of a sepsis where the minimal inhibitory concentration (MIC) of the organism is high, which is why we. Uh, uh, but, but this has to be discussed with the TDM team and also ID team, and, and also the anti uh, antimicrobial stewardship uh, team in the hospital. Uh, so, if we sometimes see why patients in the ICU are given antibiotics at high doses and shorter intervals like uh, Fortum or Vancomycin uh, through infusion in the ICU, uh, this would be it. Okay. Another recommendation of best practice, at the, at the last sentence in the slide, uh, is uh, when is in the optimizing antibiotic dose is based on uh, drug pharmacodynamics and drug properties. So this is where we involve the TDM pharmacy ID team and again the local antimicrobial stewardship team uh, in uh, certain sele in selected cases. <coughs> okay, this is another important uh, uh, aspect of uh, infection control, which is source control. With pa in patients with okay, the, the key source control is the key principle in management of sepsis and septic shock. And the so source control includes uh, drainage of abscess, debriding infected necrotic tissues, uh, removal of an infected device or line, and uh, definitive control of a source of an ongoing contamination. And source control has to be achieved as soon as possible following resuscitation. And uh, so next is uh, when do we decide for open surgical intervention uh, than uh, considering interventional or you know uh, antibiotics coverage. First, <coughs> surgical intervention is uh, indicated if interventional method is inadequate or cannot be provided in time. Secondly, if uh, the there's a diagnostic uncertainty of uh, the pathology despite uh, uh, having a CT scan or any radiological investigation ultrasound uh, regarding um, the con regarding the confirmation of uh, the source. And thirdly, if there's any uncertainty in the probability of success with percutaneous method, then we should uh, proceed straight with open surgical intervention. Also, uh, the, uh, another, another suggestion with a very low uh, grade of evidence is that clinicians should assess daily on the possibility of de-escalation of antimicrobials. Uh, against uh, giving a uh, fixed dose of therapy such as uh, antibiotics for five days, one week, or six weeks. So patients have to be uh, assessed daily. Okay, the next part is uh, hemodynamic management. This is another important um, part of uh, the guidelines. So the guidelines uh, recommended using crystalloids as first-line fluid for resuscitation, no changes there. 
then secondly uh the new the, the, this is a new part uh to the guidelines where the the, the committee suggested using balanced crystalloids instead of normal saline for resuscitation so um uh, balanced crystalloid means uh, crystalloids with uh, electronic composition closer to that of plasma such as Hartmann's solution or ringer's lactate normal saline uh is uh it, it falls out of favor because of risks of uh, hypochloremic uh, metabolic acidosis and uh, renal vasoconstriction leading to AKI. And um, a SMART trial uh, done in 2018 with uh, 15,800 uh, participants showed it, it was a single centered crossover study. It's not, a, it's not an RCT, but it's a crossover study where patients were given balanced solutions or normal saline alternating on a monthly or basis. So the uh, crossover study found that. Uh, the outcomes in ICU patients with sepsis resulted in um, uh, lower 30-day mortality uh, in patients who were given balanced solution compared to normal saline. Okay. Next is uh, the guidelines suggested uh, the use of uh, albumin in patients to receive uh, large volumes of crystalloids. This is mainly to maintain oncotic pressure. The uh, cons of uh, using albumin is that it's expensive and there's no clear benefit demonstrated in the studies that were uh, reviewed. Uh, there is a Cochrane review of uh, the use of albumin versus crystalloid, which showed that there's no difference in 30 or 90 day mortality in patients used. So uh, albumin uh, should not be the first line fluid use for resuscitation, but mainly as a uh, a tool to maintain oncotic pressure in patients. Okay, okay next is um, the use of uh, other agents such as uh, hydroxyethyl starch. So the guidelines are uh, no change from the previous guidelines. Uh, starch is uh, still uh, the, the guidelines recommended against using starches for resuscitation because uh, there is a high risk of uh, AKI leading to renal replacement therapy or death in patients who are giving HES. Next is uh, gelatin, which is a synth uh, synthetic colloid. This is a new uh, the 2016 guidelines suggested using crystalloids over gelatins when resuscitating patients, where else the current guidelines are uh, recommended against using gelatin. So, uh, the, 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 okay, so the evidence against gelatin was uh, a meta-analysis of RCTs that showed firstly no benefit to mortality versus crystalloids, high risk of uh, EKI leading to renal replacement therapy, and also risk of anaphylaxis uh, that uh, pertain to use, using a gelatin. So this is why we don't use gelatin or HES in our practice. Okay. Then uh, another another recommendation, uh, week, sorry, another suggestion is uh, to start uh, inotropes peripherally to restore MAP rather than delaying uh, commencing inotropes until uh, CBL is inserted. Okay, this is a busy slide. If uh, you have difficulty viewing the slide, you may just uh, use two fingers, pinch on your screen and uh, zoom in. So basically what this slide uh, is trying to say is that, sorry. Vessel presses in septic shock, uh, they've changed the sequence. The first line will be NORAD, second line vasopressin, and third line adrenaline. And the guidelines have uh, are spoken against using terlipressin because uh, it is uh, it causes it has caused digital ischemia in 23 out of 260 patients. Uh, also has caused uh, diarrhea and mesenteric ischemia. Uh, this uh, evidence is weak, but uh, uh, the, the guideline suggested against using it. And there's also a special group of patients, uh, basically patients who have uh, cardiac dysfunction and uh, in shock with, all, with a persistent hypoperfusion. That means uh, patients with um, cardiac problems, but we have resuscitated them, but they are still in shock. We can consider NORAD plus dobutamine instead of uh, NORAD alone. Because uh, what 
uh, Dobu does is that it increases uh, the uh, cardiac output and uh, oxygen transport, improves blood fusion and tissue oxygenation, and also improves intramucosal acidosis and hyperlipidemia. Uh, alternatively, we can give adrenaline alone to this group of patients. Next is a ventilatory uh, ventilation strategy. This is uh, this is more relevant to uh, in ICU settings. So uh, what the guidelines mentioned is that uh, patients with sepsis induced respiratory failure would uh, uh, recommended sorry are suggested to use high flow nasal oxygen over non invasive ventilation. Now why high flow nasal cannula and not uh, no NIV? Firstly, patient with severe hypoxia requires escalation of oxygen support. Benefits of NIV is that uh, it avoids risk of intubation and invasive ventilation, improves work of breathing and improves gas exchange. However, problem with NIV is uh, it increases risk of uh, gastric insufflation, aspiration, uh, facial pressure sore, and uh, uh, patient's discomfort relate related to inability to eat or effectively speak. Lah. Uh, and uh, the benefits of high flow nasal cannula. Uh, okay, wait. Uh, high flow nasal cannula is a non invasive ventilation which delivers high concentration of oxygen that warms and humidifies secretions with the high flow rates. So, it is a better tool to match patients' oxygen demand with a modest positive pressure effect and uh, with the ability to deliver uh, FiO2 of up to 95 to 100%. <coughs> And then uh, other recommendations for ventilation in sepsis-induced ARDS is um, um, low tidal volume is uh, preferred to high volume, uh, high tidal volume. Uh, use of max uh, plateau pressure of 30 cm water. Uh, use of higher peak compared to lower peak. Uh, you, uh, then use of uh, prone ventilation in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. And um, uh, Lastly, we know venous ECMO, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, when uh, the conventional ventilation fails. However, the last option is costly and it's only available in centers with uh, uh, dedicated uh, perfusion and cardiac anesthesia. <coughs> uh, this, uh, another, uh, this is an, another important domain where uh, additional therapies are recommended in uh, patients with sepsis. Firstly, if uh, patients has okay, patients with uh, in, okay, if patient has AKI with pH less than seven point two, we may give sodium bicarb, and uh, if there's no in, uh, real indication for uh, RRT, we uh, the guidelines suggested against uh, RRT. Next, uh, if patient has uh, sugar of more than ten, may a patient shall. Uh, Patients are recommended to start be started on insulin therapy. If uh, patients okay, and also the guidelines recommended early initiation of uh, enteric feeding, like if possible. Then <coughs> the guidelines recommended against using sodium bicarb in lactate acidemia. If the intention to give the sodium bicarb is to improve hemodynamics or reduce visceral pressure requirement. However, if uh, the intention to give sodium bicarb is to uh, improve the uh, pH uh, temporarily, then uh, that may be, yeah, there's no problem doing that. Lah. And uh, the guidelines also recommended against giving IV vitamin C. <coughs> uh, last is uh, the goals of care. To, uh, to enhance the recovery, the guidelines recommended screening for economic and uh, social support for patients and families, involving patients and families in shared decision making regarding the discharge plan, uh, medications at both ICU and hospital discharge, and also uh, including information about uh, patient sepsis and uh, the possibility of uh, you know, impairments related to patients' hospitalization uh, upon discharge. Then the guidance also suggested having a critical care transitional program during ICU stay to floor. That means a proper pass over between the ICU and uh, the ward team. And also uh, a, a, a re verbal and written sepsis education program. And, uh, if, uh, and then after recovery, patient who should be re uh, referred to peer support groups and um, uh, if, if need to, 
uh, post hospital rehabilitation program. And lastly, in line with the 2017 WHO resolution on sepsis, <laughs> which called for improving outcomes of sepsis survivors and addressing the survivors' access to rehabilitation, the guidelines recommended patients and families to be educated about information about their stay in ICU, sepsis, and the uh, treatment and common impairments that patients and family members may need to uh, look out for after the discharge. And this should be done in verbal and uh, written summaries. <coughs> and finally, during follow-up, patients should be reassessed for any physical, cognitive, and emotional duress uh, after the, since discharge. So that's the end of my presentation, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for listening.